Hello, everybody. Welcome back to A Few Minutes of History. I'm your host, Jake. And for those of you that are new, welcome. And for those of you that are old hands, welcome back. Today, we shall be talking about the Altmark incident. We're used to stories from the days of sail about ships being boarded and hand-to-hand combat involving cutlass-wielding pirates and sailors taking place. But what we don't expect to hear is the story of a ship being boarded by cutlass-wielding sailors of the Royal Navy during the Second World War. This is the unusual story of HMS Cossack and her tangle with the German supply ship, the Altmark. HMS Cossack was the fifth ship to carry the name. She was a tribal-class destroyer. Her keel was laid down on the 9th of June, 1936, at the Vickers Armstrong Yard on the Tyne. She was launched on the 8th of June, 1937, and commissioned into the Royal Navy on the 14th of June, 1938. In February 1940, Cossack was part of a force sent to look for a German supply ship, the Altmark, which was believed to have prisoners on board that had been seized by the German raider, the Graf Spee, in various engagements in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Altmark had so far ran the British gauntlet and attempted to head back to Germany with the prisoners. She got to Norway, which was still neutral at this point of the war, and after encounters with the Norwegian Navy, who had insisted on boarding to check for weapons and prisoners, the Altmark had tried to continue on to Germany. However, on the 16th of February 1940, Altmark was spotted by an RAF Hudson plane and was cornered by the destroyers HMS Intrepid and Ivanhoe near the ice-choked entrance to a fjord. Her captain, Heinrich Dow, gave orders to go full steam ahead, and the Altmark forced her way through the ice and into the fjord. HMS Cossack, which was nearby, and two Norwegian gunboats then gave chase, the Norwegians ordering the British to leave their territorial waters, as they had previously done with the Germans. The Altmark came to a full stop in the fjord, and Philip Vane, the Cossack's captain, brought his ship alongside. Cossack's railings had been removed, ready for boarding, and the boarding party were armed and waiting. The Germans on the opposite side were likewise waiting to repel them. The Altmark's captain ordered that all British prisoners were to be kept below decks in case they swamped and overran the crew in an attempt to escape. Dow, the German captain, then put his ship into full astern in an attempt to push the Cossack into the fjord's steep banks. But Vane anticipated this and swung his ship round to counter the manoeuvre. The two ships briefly came together and the 24-man boarding party, led by Lieutenant Commander Bradley Turner, started to jump across to the Altmark but only a few of them made it across before the ships moved apart again. Cossack then, once again, came alongside, and the rest of the boarding party jumped aboard, shouting with rifles and bayonets fixed. The Germans were trying to launch a lifeboat to escape, but one opened fire with a rifle to repel the boarders. This was met with a hail of rifle fire in return. The boarders then set about the Altmark's crew with rifle butts of bayonets, despite being outnumbered six to one. Some German sailors on the other side of the ship lowered a lifeboat and started to climb down. One of the British sailors fired several shots at the boat, which filled it with water and rendered it useless. Turner and some of the boarding party got to the bridge, and he questioned Captain Dow as to where the prisoners were being held. Dow then led them to the hold hatches, which were then opened. A call was made. Are there any Englishmen down there? Following a loud response by the prisoners, the prisoners were then told in return, then come up, the Navy's here. The evacuation of the prisoners was done at haste, as it was believed that the Altmark had some explosive charges set to scuttle her. Some of the British started leading German prisoners onto the Cossack, but Captain Vane ordered all Germans be left behind on the Altmark. In all, 299 men were rescued from the Altmark. After the engagement, eight Germans were killed and five were wounded with small arms fire and bayonets in the brisk but frantic and hellish action. But what of the story that a cutlass was being carried? This seems to be solved by the testimony of a boarding party member called Jim Halliday, who stated that when the call was put out for the crew to take part in the boarding, All he could find was a bayonet. This was most likely a First World War era sword bayonet, so-called due to its ferocious 17-inch long blade. He himself believed that this is where the story had come from. It could also come from a radio message sent by the Altmark as the boarding took place, in which they said British pirates had boarded them. The bayonet explanation is highly plausible, because at that time, and to even some extent now, the Royal Navy had older equipment than the Army often getting its cast-offs as far as small arms and personal weapons went. The Navy here became a popular rallying cry throughout the war, and the action was therefore known as the Altmark Incident. Well, that concludes today's episode. I hope you all enjoyed that. I really enjoyed researching it and, and finding out about that incident. But before we finish, I want to quickly chat to you about a few things that I've got coming up and that I'm really excited about. My friends over at Pen & Sword, a British uh, publisher, I've been in touch with me and basically want to do a few interviews involving myself and and some of their authors, which I'm really excited about. 
Um, one of the books that we shall be doing in the future is called The True Story of the Christmas Truce, British and German Eyewitness Accounts from the First World War by Anthony Richards. And that's something I'm really looking forward to because it's one of those things that's sort of brought up in myth, isn't it, about the, the First World War and the Christmas Truce. So I'm really looking forward to, to reading that book and talking to Anthony about about you know his experience in researching it and, and what he learned about the uh, the Christmas truce and also my good friend Anthony Tucker Jones who I've had on the show a couple of times now he published a book uh, a while ago called Life and Death on the Eastern Front which is a, a lot of rare color photographs from the Second World War of the Eastern Front and I shall be talking to Ian Stewart who basically sourced all of these pictures and if you haven't seen a copy of the book i'll link it below in the description and on, on youtube as well i'll link it and I'll, I'll put a picture of the book on there so you can see it but it's absolutely superb some of these pictures are, are fantastic and it's it's everything from you know german soldiers you know shaving and, and eating to to full engagements in battle and you know russian prisoners being marched along it, it's a superb book and it, i honestly can't can't recommend it enough so that's something that I'm really looking forward to. I also want to thank everybody for supporting the podcast and the YouTube channel, which is over obviously on YouTube. I'm at 300 and I think it's six subscribers on there, which is superb. I'm also nearly at 8,000 followers on TikTok, which is a bit crazy. But the podcast, you know, I'm at, I've am hit over 2,000 downloads now. So I just want to thank everyone for that. It's been been absolutely amazing um, from starting a, a podcast and a channel from, from nothing to be hitting some really good success like that is is superb. So I just want to thank everybody. I've had downloads from from everywhere, from you know the UK and America, all over Asia, Africa. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy to me that people are people are listening to me ramble on about certain topics. Thank you all very much for listening, and we'll see you on the next one. Cheery, bye.